Thank you, my friends, for joining me once again for the study of the second part of Matthew chapter 3. The author of this commentary is Dr. J. Vernon McGee. As we continue reading this chapter, we see that John the Baptist does not hold his tongue. He certainly wasn't whispering. And he goes on to say, And now also the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which fails to bring forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So much for diplomacy. There is a great deal said in Scripture about fruit bearing. And fruit bearing is a result of having the right kind of tree. You all know that only a fruit tree can bear fruit. And in the Bible, Israel is often referred to as a fig or an olive tree. And here John is warning that the axe has been put to the root of the trees. Of course, a fig tree should produce figs, and an olive tree should produce olives. But when a fruit tree produces nothing but thorns, it's not a fruit tree anymore and needs to be cut down. So the root and the tree go together. A tree has to be of the right rootstock in order for it to bear fruit. And that's what John is saying here. A tree with the wrong kind of root brings the wrong kind of fruit and is taken down. Now listen to what he says in verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now I'd like to spend a moment with you here. John says, I baptize you with water, but he, Christ, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. We live in the age of the Holy Spirit, and Christ has continued this baptism in the Holy Spirit and fire for almost 2,000 years now. And every Christian, if he or she has not been baptized in the Holy Spirit at the time of their conversion, should earnestly desire it and pray for it, because it empowers the child of God tremendously. So let's continue reading here. John goes on to say that Jesus Christ, whose threshing fan is in his hand, will thoroughly purge his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the garner or storage. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then comes Jesus from Galilee to Jordan to John to be baptized of him. Now this is a remarkable incident that happens here. It begs the question, why was Jesus baptized? Well, as we read further, we'll see why. We read, But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of you, and now you've come to me? And Jesus, answering, said to him, Let it be so now, for thus it is proper for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John allowed him. So why was Jesus baptized? There may be several answers, but I believe the primary reason is given to us right here, when the Lord Jesus said that it is essential for the fulfillment of all righteousness. Secondly, he's identifying himself completely here with sinful mankind, just as the prophet had written 700 years earlier, that he was numbered with the transgressors. So here we have the king and the ruler of the entire universe coming down and identifying himself completely with his subjects. I believe this is another very important reason for the baptism of the Lord Jesus. He chose not to remain detached far away from his creation, but he chose to be fully identified with his sinful subjects. He did not get baptized just to set us an example. He didn't need the baptism of repentance because he was perfectly holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from us sinners. But in order to justify us and pay our moral debt, he needed to fully identify himself with the human race. And that's why he was numbered with us, the transgressors. And take note that his death on the cross was also a type of baptism. That's what he said to the apostles James and John when they said they wanted a place next to him when he receives his glory. He says, are you able to be baptized with the baptism I am being baptized with? In this statement, he was referring to his death on the cross. 
His death was a baptism. He entered into death for you and for me. And finally, the third reason for Christ's baptism was to set him aside for his office as high priest. You'll know that the Holy Spirit came upon him in front of everyone for this ministry. So whatever he did, he did in the full power of the Holy Spirit. He who knew no sin was made sin for us. There was sin on him, that is our sin, but there was no sin in him. My sin was put on him, and that's very important for us to understand. And now, therefore, praise the Lord, you and I are saved because we became identified with him. He identified himself with us in baptism. And the Apostle Peter says that we are saved in baptism. Why so? Because in baptism, we ourselves are being identified with the Lord Jesus. And that's what it means to be saved. That's what the term to be in Christ means. I believe in baptism. And I think that baptism is a declaration that I am fully identified with Christ. And Christ says in the Gospel of John, He that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. So today we must recognize that we have to be identified with Him. And we do that through our baptism in water, by which we fulfill all righteousness. An old sage said to a young sailor that he was trying to get to accept Christ and be baptized. He said, young man, it's either duty or mutiny. And when you come to Christ, it is your duty to be baptized. Anything else is mutiny. This is a tremendous truth. And I feel that this is something I need to elaborate on. Because the subject of water baptism needs to be lifted from the realm of constant arguing and bickering. And up onto the high and lofty plane of complete obedience to the Lord. And we're going to stand for Christ in a very wonderful way. So if Christ himself was baptized, we need to be baptized too. Let it be so now, for thus it is proper for us to fulfill all righteousness. He chooses to identify himself with all humanity, and only then does John baptize him. And now let's read verse 16. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened up, and he saw the Spirit of God like a dove descending upon him, and a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So we see right here that John also acknowledges the Trinity. Here you have the Son, the Lord Jesus, and then the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And then finally, the Father speaking as a voice from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So in baptism, God's Son is identified with his people. Oh, what a wonderful mystery there is in God coming down to earth in his Son and becoming our friend in suffering. He is the King of the earth and the universe, and oh, what a wonderful King he is. Let's make him King and Lord of our hearts today, and he promises to give us life abundantly. The abundant life in Jesus Christ is something that only the born-again Christian can have. Now I'd like to thank you for setting aside the time to study God's wonderful Word. May God bless you richly till we meet again for the study of chapter 4 of this wonderful Gospel of Matthew. Goodbye for now. Mm -hmm.